yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rap the with the church a few times. Now nuts trying to low bar. Okay. All right. Um, so today's lecture is one that we haven't taught before in 721 on multi-way joins. Now, I, I was debating whether to call the lecture worst case optimal joins or multi-way joins. Um, and the term worst case optimal is a sort of category of multi-way joins uh, that we're only going to focus on. But it, the, in my opinion, the term is confusing. Um, and apparently, there's an anecdote where Don Knuth thought this, the, ter the, the term worst case optimal join was confusing as well. Uh, I'll send the link on Piazza afterwards. Um, but let's, let's, let's jump into this and uh, sort of cover it at a high level. And th this will be a shorter lecture. So the last two classes, we've talked about hash joins and, uh, and short merge joins. And these were always in the context or being done as binary joins, meaning we have, we have two tables. We're joining them together. And now if a query has multiple tables that it wants to join together, uh, we're going to do this as a series of binary joins. And there's been decades in, of, of research on, on how to make these joins go really fast. So this is sort of the, the, the default choice for everyone when they build a new system. So th this is fine and dandy, uh, assuming you get the join order correct, which we'll, we're, we'll cover uh, in, in a week or two. Um, and this, is, this works great also, too, when the, the output of the join is, is decreasing in size. Like you're, you're trying to push down or do the joins that are going to be the most, um, do the most, be the most selective as early as possible in the query plan. So that the output of, of that result of the join is smaller as you go up the query plan, right? So this again, this is fine when every when the output is always smaller, but things can go bad uh, if the output now is larger than the inputs. So for this join here, instead of having the output of you know from joining S and T each have 100 tuples, if the output is now a thousand then now I have to join 100 tuples over here with 1,000 tuples over here. Even though the output, again, it was going to be smaller, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be 10 tuples. Right? And again, these are small numbers, but again, think of terms of like millions or billions. Right? This, this can be problematic. And so the, the goal what we're trying to solve today is how can, we, how can we join maybe R, S, and T in this example together at the same time so that we don't have to materialize this, this, this larger intermediate result. So again, just visualizing the, the same query I had before, now with exactly with, with you know, real numbers. Uh, this is essentially, it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, sometimes it's called a triangle query, um, or it's, it's, a, it's a query with, with a cycle. Right? We're trying to join everybody with, with everybody. So no matter what order we try to join these, these three tables together, we're always going to have the intermediate output be larger. So we join R and S, we get a large table like this. But then when we join it with T, we, it gets filtered down. Same thing if you do R and T, and same thing when you do S and T. All right, so the, this thing is the problem that we're trying to solve today, that we want to avoid having to materialize an intermediate result that is larger than, than our inputs. And the reason why we don't want to do this is because obviously it's, it's wasted computation as we execute the query, because now we've got to take this larger, t larger intermediate result and join it, with, with, join it with the table, with the next table in our query plan. And obviously, oh, we also have to now materialize this in, into memory or in disk. So wasting storage space, why we do this. So the high level goal of what these multi-way or the worst, co worst case optimal joins are is that we're going to try to join all three tables or three or more tables together at the same time by examining their attributes rather than uh, one at a time rather than looking at, uh, looking at each table at a time. Now, again, I'll show visually what I mean by this. And much, again, if you take the intro class, if you know anything about databases, this is a way different way, this is a much different way to think about how to do joins than the binary joins, right? And this is rare. Not everyone does this, but I'll talk a little at the end. This is, I think, the future of the next 10 years in relational databases that everyone's going to have to support these worst case optimal joins. So I'm going to talk about the, 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 the two main implementations. Well, I'll start with some background on worst case optimal joins. But I'm only going to focus on two, the two main implementations that are out there. Um, one was the paper you guys read that was in Umbra. Uh, and then there's this uh, leapfrog try join from the logic block guys that actually, that actually predates the hash try join from, from Umbra. Um, there is another one that just came out uh, that's an extension of the leapfrog try join 
from uh, researchers at the University of Washington. That literally came out a month ago on the archive, so I, I didn't have time to include this. There's another paper uh, from Stanford called Empty Headed or Level Headed. The Hash Tribe paper alludes to this. We won't cover that. These two are considered the superior ones. And the Germans claim that theirs is the best. Okay? All right, so the, again, the high level idea what we're trying to do here is instead of trying to join tables by examining two tables at a time, doing the join, and then moving on to the next table, we're instead going to look at the attributes, the variables that they want, they want to join, and examine those first, then, which may span multiple relations, multiple tables. For simplicity today, we're only going to look at three table joins, but you can easily extend this you know, beyond, beyond that. So this idea of this, this the worst case optimal join was first proposed by different Germans in, or the theoreticians in 2008. And then there was a sort of two major works done in the early 2010s, one from Chris Ray on empty headed or level headed. And then there was uh, this, this, this leapfrog try join from the logical blood guys that I'll talk about in a second. So what's interesting about worst case optimal joins is that the, the its runtime is going to be bounded by the, the, the size of the result that it's generating and the number of, of variables that you need to evaluate. And if, just like in, in, in a binary join where you have to get the join order incorrect, right, to, to, to you know, do the most selective join as quickly as possible, so you, you, you throw away data, the data you know you're not going to need, in worst case optimal joins, you want to evaluate the variables or attributes across relations in order such that you, you remove tuples or dead tuples that, that you know you're not going to need. So it's, again, we're only going to talk about the algorithm here. The figuring out the right, the right ordering of, these relate, of the attributes uh, is a whole other problem in, in query optimization. The, the hyper paper you guys read, or the umber paper you guys read, talks about it a little bit, but we're not going to go too, too deep on it today. All right? Because the idea here is that if we get the right ordering, we, if we can find out tuples that aren't going to match for the first set of attributes we're examining. We don't have to do examine the, the other ones. And in some cases, if we're, if we're traversing the try uh, or whatever data structure you're using, you, you can just skip whole sec sections of it. The, the other interesting thing about worst case optimal joins is that the, the more tables that are, go into it, the better its performance can be relative to the input because you can look at more tables and throw things out uh, more quickly, again, sooner rather than later. All right, and this is sort of the opposite behavior of uh, of a uh, of a you know of a, of a binary of a binary join, right? We really have the notion of, of more tables, but like it's be, the behavior isn't sorry, the runtime isn't exactly bounded by the output size. It's a, it's a different beast, right? So, I again for me when I when I read these papers, the worst case optimal join seems kind of counterintuitive, right? Um, and there's, there's a definition from this professor up in Waterloo who's building a, a, a graph database that, that supports worst case optimal joins. Um, and he has in his, in his blog article here that, 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 that I'm citing, he talks about the, the, the definition means, the definition of what you think about worst case optimal is that it's the, it's the worst case runtime of the algorithm. Uh, the worst case runtime of the algorithm will, will meet some lower bound that's been defined um, that's going to be the lowest, the lowest runtime of all possible join algorithms for the worst case scenario. That's kind of confusing, too. My definition, and again, I'm probably wrong, but I'm sure someone will correct me on, on, on YouTube, uh, that the, it's the runtime of the join algorithm is better than all other join algorithms when the query and the data that the query is going to process represent the worst possible scenario. Right? That, that you're going to do better than, the, than a binary join could possibly do. It may not be fantastic. You know, it's obviously not going to be you know, log n to do the join but it's going to be better than what you would have done if you did a binary join. And again, this, this link here will take you to a footnote in the blog article from the guy at Waterloo where he talks about Don Knuth. Did not, he did not like this term as well. And he's a professor at Stanford, so you know. <laughs> All right. All right, so there's not very, very many systems that implement this. Right? The, the graph database systems don't do this because they, they don't really have a notion of tables and doing joins. Right? They're doing graph traversals of, of, of the... You know, of, of, the, of the data structure. Um, so as of 2023, the, the only two commercial systems that support this or support worst case optimal joins 
are relational AI and logic blocks. And logic blocks will be the leapfrog tri-join that I'll talk about in a second. And actually, relational AI are the people that formed logic blocks. Logic blocks got bought. All the guys in them went and formed relational AI. Right? So it's the same people. Right? The, the, the leapfrog, leapfrog tri-join in logic blocks is the first, I think, commercial implementation of a worst case optimal join. In academia, the, the first one would have been empty headed from Ken Chris Ray at Stanford uh, in the early 2010s. There's the Umbra one that we've talked about. And then uh, DuckDB is, there's a paper insider this year. Like this is all very, very, very new. It's a paper insider this year where Peter Bontz, the guy that built Vectorwise, uh, he added worst case optimal joins to DuckDB. Um, and then Kuzu is, the, is a graph database um, based out of, out of Waterloo. So not very many systems. You don't see Snowflake. You don't see SQL Server. You don't see Oracle and so forth. Um, but I, would, I, I think what's going to change in this decade is that as of this year, the SQL standard is going to support this new extension called SQL PC, PGQ, uh, Property Graph Queries. It looks a lot like the Cypher language that, 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 that's in Neo4j for, for running queries on graph databases. This is now going to be in the SQL standard. And so that means that you're going to be able to use relational databases as you know, Ted Codd you know, uh, predicted back in the day for any possible data types. Uh, and you could do now the graph traversal stuff where you would need the worst case optimal joins that we're talking about today to operate efficiently on this data. Right? So that's why this matters. That's why, and, and again, there's, there's not much uh, fat to cut off on hash joins and sort merge joins. Right? I think I told you this. I had a student, uh, a former PhD student of mine. He spent six months trying to speed up hash joins in our system, and he got it down from 12 cycles per, per tuple, which was the state of the art at the time, to 11 cycles. Right? We're literally counting single, single cycles. That's not a paper. That's not research. There isn't that much you, you, can, you can do. Um, you know, anytime you have to go to disk or anytime you have to spill out your CPU caches, you're always going to be bottlenecked by the, um, you know, by, by the hardware. In these worst case optimal joins, I think this is still uh, fertile territory for some major uh, algorithmic and implementation improvements uh, to get, you know, potentially order magnitude speed, speed up over what we're currently doing today. So th again, this is all very, very new. All right, so I'm going to talk about the leapfrog tri-join um, from Logic Blocks. And this came out in, in, in 2014. Uh, and then they have a newer version in relational AI called the dovetail join, which is a worst case optimal join algorithm. But I can't tell what it does because they have a five minute YouTube video that doesn't say anything. And I, I, maybe I just missed the paper. Um, but we'll, we'll just focus on this one. Because again, this is what the, the hyper guys address a lot of the deficiencies in this implementation they address in, in theirs, as well as the empty headed one. So for this one, they're going to assume that all the, uh, the, the tables you want to sort are either going to be, uh, or you want to, tables you want to join are going to be sorted ahead of time on the join keys, or you're going to build a, uh, a try index for them on the fly. And then the idea is that the, the try is going to represent the, the, the join key itself. And every, every level in the try will represent a different attribute that, that's going to be computed as part of the join. Do you know what a try is? Do you not know what a try is? All right, all right then, then I'll, I'll, well, I'll just show this quickly. We, we used to teach tries, and then students didn't know what, didn't know what they were. Uh, in this class, we used to teach a whole lecture on like radix trees, tries, the art index stuff. Uh, and I might have mentioned this at some point in the intro class, I forget. Uh, but just, just quickly to make sure everyone knows, knows what it is. Is the intro class Project Zero? <laughs> oh, it's Project Zero now? All right, even better. Yes, perfect. OK, sure. All right, this is what a try is. So instead of like a B plus tree, where you store, you store the entire key uh, inside of a node and you do whole key comparisons, and a try, you break up the key into its individual components or digits. And then you store those at the different levels. So let's say I have three keys, hello, hat, and have. So the, the way you would, you would represent or f find this key would be the path into the try. So at the first level, you have H, because that's the, and you only have one entry at the, at, the, at the top level, because that's H is the common letter and all, all the keys. And then going down here, you find H-E-L-L-O, -L -L, right? The tries are old. They're like from 1959 uh, by some French guy. And then the, the term try was coined by this guy, Edward Fredkin, uh, Fredkin, who apparently is faculty here at CMU. 
I think he's still alive. I've never seen him, but he's still, I think he's still listed. Anyway, tries are really interesting. Tries um, are an alternative to, to B trees or B plus trees. They're not that common because the, you know, the cost of representing these different levels when you have these, these variable length uh, size nodes can be challenging. Um, but they show up in a bunch of interesting places. I know the Cassandra guys are making heavy use of this now for the LSM. Um, it's, a very, it's, it's, it's one of these data structures that the days people have kind of like ignored for a while. And then the hyper guys put them, brought them back into vogue about 10, 10 years or so. OK, so let's see how we can use these to do a uh, the, the, the try join with in, in logical blocks. All right, so we have our three tables, x, y, z. Um, again, and the way we're going to, to, to do the, the join is basically we're going to iterate through the try uh, and do comparisons to see whether we have a match across the different relations. And we sort of go one relation at a time uh, looking for a match. So the first thing we need to do is sort it. Done that. And then for simplicity, rather than show me, I'll show the try structure in the next slide, I'm just going to show you, like, here's, here's the values you could possibly have. And so for each of these, you start with the iterator that's going to you know, walk the list of, of, of values. And you start, obviously, with the first position. So the x iterator starts at 0, the y iterator starts at 0, and the, the z iterator starts at 2. Right? That's, that's the initial starting point. So now, again, we're going to walk through one by one of the, the, the different lists of values from the different relations and try to see if we have a match. And if, if we know that the, the last iterator that we looked at has a value greater than, than the one we're looking at, we're, that our iterator is currently pointing at, we need to jump ahead or leapfrog ahead into the list to try to find a match. So in this case here, if we start with the x iterator here, the last iterator we would examine upon initialization would have been z. So z is looking at 2. We're pointing, we're, sorry, z is pointing at 2. We're pointing at 0. 0 is less than 2. So we've got to jump over until we find either 2 or the first value that's greater than 2. Right? So in this case, it would be 3. So we, we increment our iterator to 3 here, and then we move down to the next iterator. So again, the, the, so the last iterator pointed at 3. We're currently at 0. 0 is less than 3. So now we need to jump to the first value that's greater than uh, equal to or greater than, than 3 to be 6. Same thing, come down here at, at, at z. Last iterator is 6. We're pointing at 2. So jump ahead past 4 and 5 to get to 8. Come back around. We jump uh, to 8 here. We jump to 8 here. And then now we have a match. All right. Conceptually, that's what we're doing. All right. And then obviously, this, is, this would be expensive to sort of have a list like this. Um, and so we're going uh, to use tries to speed things up. All right, so we're going to take the same list we had before, but now the, the different attributes we're going to represent at different, at different, uh, different levels in the try. Right? So in the, the, the first level will always just be the, the, the identifier of what, what relation we are, so relation R. The second level will be the first attribute, in this case A, and then the, the, bottom, relation, the bottom level will be the attribute B. So we're going to build this try structure for all of the... Uh, for all of the for all the relations we, we want to join. So you end up like this. Right? So R has A and B. So the first level is A, second level is B. T has A and C, and S has B and C. So say now we want to join R and S and T together. So assuming that we've, we, the, the query optimizer has figured out, OK, the, the first attribute I want to examine is A. Like that's, I'm going to do A, B, and then C to do my join. So I'm going to start here in the, the first relation. I traverse into R, uh, and then I, I land at A0. And I can use that 0 to then probe into this relation for T, and I, and I get 0. So now I, I want to go s find the matches for, uh, for C in, in over here. So I start with my uh, first relation on B. Sorry, the second attribute um, um, in R on B. Use that to probe into the try on S. And now I'm going to have an iterator down here for, for the values of C and an iterator down here. So for simplicity, I can just scan through and get all of them. Right? Instead of doing a comparison uh, one by one, I'll just get, I'll just get the, the set of the, of the attributes. Then now I can take the intersection of those. I know what A is, because that's how I got here, and it was 0. 
and now I'm looking for matches. I, I know what B, or sorry, I know what B is because it's zero because that's how I got there. So now I'm doing the intersection on values of C, right? And you end up with, with these, you know, with those three tuples. So you need to do the same thing. So now you iterate over here by one. You get you get B equals one. Uh, you're going to use that when you then probe an S, right? Because you're already at A here. I land here, right? I rip through this, get the, get the same set I had before, 0, 1, 2. This only has one, uh, one tuple, or one, one value, 0 for C. Take the intersection, and I end up with one tuple like that. Right? I do this for the last one. I get 2 over here. Use that to probe an S, scan along his, get the same set I before, take the intersection, and I end up with the tuple. So I can just do this for all, do this for all the other ones, one by one, and then fill out the, re the rest of the join. Uh, this question is, does this apply to outer join? Uh, you wouldn't take the intersection. You would, you would, it would just be, well, it'd be matching all of them, but then whatever doesn't, whatever doesn't have a match when you do the intersection, you, you just, the value is null. But I, I actually don't know whether the worst case optimal joins, I don't, I, don't, I don't know whether people actually do that. Yes, yeah, that would be kind of weird to do a graph query with, with that louder join, I think. I think it's more of like, Is it? If, if you have a graph, you also find if, like the shortest yeah, distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like if there's no path between two vertex, then there will be a null. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But even then, like, <sighs> I see your point. Like, find me all, find me all the paths from, from A to B. But if it doesn't have one, then just put null. Uh, it's like an anti-join too, right? Like, if you're on the string of query, uh, it won't be left out of join. But. Yeah, OK. I mean, for, for simplicity, assume we're doing inner joins or doing equi joins here, OK? OK, so that's, that's the try join. Again, the, the leaf try join. The idea is, again, you have to build these tries on the fly every time you want to do a join. Now, there's the. Some other papers, they talk about, oh, the data set's read-only, and I can pre-compute all these tries ahead of time. The challenge of that one, of course, is that like, that takes up space, and you have to do it for every possible joiner you could have. And then, of course, as soon as you, if, the, if you actually do support updates, then you've got to throw everything away and start over. Now, in, in the world we've been talking about this semester, we've been assuming that our Parquet files are read-only, stored in S3, so we could do this. We could pre-compute these tries, except that for really large data sets and for any possible join order, uh, this would be expensive to do. Right? Which is basically what it said here. Right. So even again, even if it's read-only, having to build this uh, ahead of time for everything is just, just not realistic. Because you've got to store it somewhere, and then, then you've got to go read them from disk. So the, another approach, instead of using all these tries, um, from the, 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 the Stanford work is to, is to use nested hash tables. Um, and but this is going to be expensive to do, not, again, not just to have to materialize over every possible join key order you could have. Uh, but when you actually do now do the comparison, you're going to do a bunch of extra computations for uh, taking the hashes, comparing, you know, ch checking where the hashes matches, match, then checking to see whether the keys actually match because you could have collisions. Right? And then because you want to have things nicely memory aligned with variable length uh, keys, you either have to store some dictionary encoded representation of the key, which means you have to then do a lookup on the, on the dictionary to look at later on, uh, or you have to actually store the key itself, which makes the hash table bigger, or you store a pointer to the, to the, to the tuple that has the, that has the pointer to the tuple that actually has the real data, but then that's doing an, an, a lookup to again checking for collisions, and it's more cache misses and making everything slower. So this is what the Umber guys are, are, are solving in their work. The, again, the idea is, is high levels are the same. They're going to use a, a try data structure to, to quickly identify matches or the, the sequences of matches within uh, w when you do uh, multi-way joins. But the key difference is that instead of storing the actual values the way we saw in the, in the leapfrog try joins or if you use in nested hash tables, they're actually just going to store the hashes of the key join keys as 64-bit integers. 
And the advantage of that one is you get now as you do traversal of the, of the, the hash try, you're comparing integers, not actual you know, strings and, and other arbitrary values. So that means you can have a very tight code in, in your implementation that only is, is operating directly on, on integers. It also it solves the problem of dealing with uh, variable length data because everything gets put into 64-bit 64, 64 values. So the course, the problem with this one is that you, you could have collisions, right? Two different distinct values hashed to the same hash value. So you do need at the end of, uh, once you've figured out the intersection of what, what, what tuples actually match, you then have to go follow up the original tuple and see whether it's a true, uh, it's a true match or not, right? Whether, or whether you had a false positive. So I like this paper because it, uh, it's not too deep on the theory, but also like it really explains a lot of the, the low-level details of what they had to do to make this thing performant. And so I had you guys read the original paper that came out in Sigmod. There's a follow-up tech report published at the same time. It's, it's one of the citations that goes through more detail of like all the different design decisions and optimizations that they made. So this is the data structure that, that they're proposing here. Right? So again, it's just a try, nothing special. Uh, but they do some interesting things like they, they store, uh, they basically store all the key value pairs in the, at each level as 16, 16 bytes, right? Eight byte, eight byte keys or eight byte hash values as the keys and the eight byte pointers, but the pointers are special. We'll talk about that in a second. And then you have pointers down to the lower levels. And at the bottom, it's basically a giant linked list of all the, the, the tuples that match or that, that correspond to the different uh, paths down through the hashes. So there's, there's three optimizations I want to discuss that I, I think are, are critical to make this work. And the first is how they're going to represent their pointers. Um, and then we'll talk about how they do uh, minimize the amount of unnecessary work they're doing when they build these, these tries. Um, and then we'll talk about how they can do sort of fast paths for uh, sparse, sparse data sets, sparse, sparse tries. There's another optimization they're doing about this, like this uh, uh, doing address shifting. Basically, it's a way for them to represent things in, in, in smaller numbers at the different levels. All right, so the first thing optimization they did is what they call a tagged pointers. And we saw this technique before when we talked about the way hyper represented pointers in their hash table or chain hash table for joins. Right? So remember in x86-64, even though we have 64-bit pointers into memory, the hardware like Intel and AMD, they only use 48 bits. Okay? So that means you have 16 bits, you can put anything you want, and the hardware is just, just going to ignore it and drop it. So what they're going to do is they're going to store some extra metadata about what the pointer is pointing to uh, so that the, the code knows, OK, if I'm following this address to some, some, the next level might, might try, wh what is the memory layout? Wh what's actually going to look like? Because right? the, the alternative is you have to have a sort of a lookup table and says, OK, well, the, you know, you're jumping to this address, and here's, here's the size of the chain, or here's some other additional metadata about it. But instead, they can, they can represent it in just the 16, 16 bits. So the first thing we're going to have is a single bit for this, uh, of whether the path is a singleton. And that basically means, or I'll show the next slide, that like, there isn't additional levels in the try as you do your join. Um, it's just you, you could jump down directly to the, the, low, the lowest level, the leaf nodes. So you, you're, and you have a single value to look at. You have another one bit to represent whether the, 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 the pointer is pointing to a, a node that's been expanded. And they're going to do this because they want to do lazy expansion. They want to lazily build the try as needed rather than populate the whole thing all at once. Again, well, I'll cover this in the next few slides. But basically, if I call create index on a table in any database, it's going to do a sequential scan and build out the entire B plus G or hash, hash index, whatever it is. And in their world, because the way, because you're doing joins and it's an ephemeral data structure, you know there's going to be some paths or some parts of, of the data structure you're never going to access. So why, why build it? So they're going, to, they're going to build it on demand. Then they're going to maintain the, uh, the uh, in 14 bits, the size of the, of the chain uh, that you end up pointing to. And this allows you to do the, the allocate the memory you need for, 
the upper level nodes as, as you do uh, on-demand expansion. And then the last 48 bits is just the memory address. So let me go through, again, the, the, the singleton and the uh, singleton and expansion op optimizations. So with, with singleton, the idea is that if I know that from some point in, in my, my try, as I'm doing my join, it, there isn't any branching. It's a straight path down to the actual tuple, right? Then I can, rather than storing the intermediate nodes down to that, that leaf node, I just have a direct, direct path to it. So in this case here, again, so think of like the first level is, is hashing on the first, the, it's the hashes of the first attribute I'm doing my join on, and then we have the hashes of the second attribute, and then these are actual, the underlying tuples that, that I'm representing. So for this, for this hash on, on an attribute, hash, first hash, a first attribute joined on, on attribute zero or value zero, there isn't any alternatives. It's only going to be the other attribute's going to be one. So it's, again, it's a straight path here. So what I can do instead is instead of storing that, that intermediate node, I just have a direct path to the bottom. And then I set a bit to, to tell me that the thing you're about to point to is going to be the actual data you're looking for, not the other value. And again, as you traverse a, a, a B plus tree or a try, you're obviously keeping track of what level you're at, right? And so you would know, okay, if it was, if it was a, a balanced tree, you would know, okay, I'm at the leaf node, therefore I can interpret the, the data I'm looking at a certain way. Because otherwise you have to store metadata in the actual node itself to say, okay, this is the leaf node or this is whatever. So by storing that single bit in, in, the, in the pointer that's pointing to this thing, I don't have to do any lookup. I know that I'm jumping to something that's going to be the actual tuple and not, a, not another node in my try. All right, the next optimization is to do lazy expansion. So the idea here is that if we assume that the join is going to be very selective uh, and that I'm not, most of the time I'm not going to access most of the, the, of most of the nodes in my try at all. So again, why even bother building it? So in the very beginning, the only thing they populate is the root node uh, and then the, the, the link list of all the, the tuples at the bottom. So only when now you go and, and do a probe into, the, into the, the, the try as part of the join, then you go back and then populate things. So in this case here, I, the, I do my lookup. The first attribute, I want to get one. So my iterator would start here. I would look at my memory address. It would, it, I would look in the first flag. It tells me that, it, that it, the thing I'm pointing to is not expanded. And that's, so therefore, it's going to be the, the last level. So now when I come down here, I know I'm looking at this, this linked list of all the values or all the, the sets of tuples that correspond to this hash value of the first attribute. So all I do now is just traverse along this, get, get, get the list of those tuples. And then now I want to expand it for the next query that comes along, or the next, next probe into my hash table comes along. It may go down the same path. I want to go ahead and build the, the intermediate, intermediate node here, the, the second level. And so what they can do is they store the, the length of this chain that I'm pointing to down here in the, to, in the, in the pointer at the, at the root. So I know the size of this value I expect to see. So I can allocate this now, right, as I, as, you know, at the very beginning, do the traversal, and then populate it as, as I go along. Because right? otherwise you have to, again, scan this linked list and not know the size until you, until you finish scanning it. So after I do this, then I go back and update the, 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 the pointer in the root to now set the expansion flag to 1. So far, so good. OK. So that's, that's pretty much all I, I really want to cover for the, for the hyper stuff, or the umber stuff, and the, uh, and the leapfrog tri-join. Tri 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 um, Again, in general, the challenge is going to be that if you only implement multi-way joins, uh, in some cases, if the intermediate result is not larger than, than the inputs, uh, it's, it's going to be slower. Again, there's a paper that just came out that says, uh, two, a month ago that says you can get the best of both worlds using the, multi -way, multi the worst case optimal joins if you have an efficient data structure. So again, this, this is still very early. The Umber guys have to then extend their optimizer to try to figure out explicitly Am I looking at, at, at a situation where I want to use a worst case optimal join versus the regular binary join? 
right? Because again, if you get it wrong, then the worst case algorithm join is going to be much slower than the binary join, right? And so they just use heuristics uh, to, to help, help them figure it out in this optimizer. So the additional consideration that, they, that they're making when they're picking, uh, when they're generating the physical plan from the logical plan. Right? And again, this, this paper is the only one that really sort of discusses this. The other papers say, hey, you want to do this, but no one really solves the problem of like, okay, when should you be doing this? Okay, so just to finish up, I think, again, as I said, this is an active area of research, and I think in the next decade, I, I, I predict that every relational database system is going to have to have support for worst case optimal joins. Maybe not exactly in the way we talked about it here today, but again, I think people will have a bunch of new ideas as they come along. Again, we need this. We're going to need, all these systems are going to need this because you want to support the, the, the property of query extensions that's coming out in the SQL standard this year. You need to do these, these worst case optimal joins because graph traversals are also oftentimes looking at, at cycles um, in, in the data set. And so if this is true, if my prediction is true that all these systems now support worst case optimal joins, relational data systems, systems support worst case optimal joins, and the SQL extensions to do property graph queries, to me, in my opinion, this is, this is, this is going to kill off all the graph databases, right? Neo4j, TigerGraph, MemGraph, whatever. I mean, they're not going to die and be gone forever, like still be there, but they're not going to get the, sort of the, the market penetration that relational databases have had, because relational databases can do these things. OK? All right, so next class, uh, or yeah, today's Wednesday. So m Monday next week, we're going to read the, the Freud paper. Um, and this, the idea of this paper is taking UDFs, the so user-defined functions that are written in PLBG SQL, and converting them into, uh, into relational algebra at SQL that you can inline into the calling query. Um, I think this is one of the, I've said before, that I think this is one of the, the best ideas to come out in databases in the last decade uh, that came from Microsoft. Um, the Microsoft paper you read is going to talk about these, these fantastic speed-ups. Uh, Sam and Kai have basically ruined the dream for me and poked holes in a bunch of the things that, they, that they've done, uh, which is quite, quite disappointing. We'll, we will cover them. But I still think that at a high level, the technique is, is sound. And some of you guys are actually working on similar things for your, for your project, project three. But it, it is disappointing that Sam's got to ruin everything for everyone. So, OK? <laughs> That's my favorite all <laughs> 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 Yes, it's the SD Cricket I-D-E-S I make a mess unless I can do it like a Geo Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T Now here it comes, dude I play the game where there's no rules The homies on the cuff say I'm a fool cause I drink fruit Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes, yo. Here I come, Willie D, that's me Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park and South Central, G And St. Eyes when I party by the 12 pack case of a four. Six pack 40 act gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>